everybody to stand up and worship with us this morning. All right, this morning's word. Is this thing on? Okay. I don't have my ears on when I can hear. Uh, this morning's word comes out of Psalms 96, 9, and 10. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved, and he will judge the peoples with equity. Yeah. 
in order to follow Him. Listen. In its extreme form, we have people in our society who like to teach two types of theology. You have one group that teaches prosperity theology, which is word of faith theology. And if that's what you like, you're in the wrong place. Poverty theology, which God says, which they believe that God says you have to be poor in order to identify with Christ. Well, guess what? Both of them are wrong. Amen. Both sides are wrong. What Christ wants out of Christian life is a balanced, balanced Christianity. In other words, in, 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 in prosperity theology, they tell you you're never supposed to be sick, that you're never supposed to have any problems, and, and you're supposed to claim everything in the name of Jesus, and you're just going to, your life's just going to be a bed of roses. Well, that's not true. That's not true. If that's the case, then Paul wouldn't have talked about persecution, and on top of that this morning, Jesus just after you're telling his disciples that they hated me, they're going to hate you too. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you too. Hmm. Listen. As we open up our scripture this morning, we're going to try to comprehend what it means to be a witness in a hostile world. How to be a witness in a hostile world. So if you have your place in John chapter 16, begin in verse 1. He said, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you. That when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Verse 8, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Listen, to be a witness in a hated world, we must heed the counsel to the witness. We must heed the counsel to the witness. One of the name, uh, names ascribed to Christ is what? Wonderful Counselor. Aren't you glad? He, one of the names ascribed to Christ is wonderful counselor. Listen, a good teacher will give good counsel. Amen. Jesus is the ultimate teacher. He is a wonderful counselor. In verse 1, we see the counsel of caution. We see the counsel of caution. He said, I have said all these things to you to keep you from what? Falling away. The phrase, all these things, refers back to the Lord's warning about the world's hatred. What has he already said in previous verses? If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. He was saying, remember what I just told you. These verses are a continuation of the disclosure of the coming hatred of the world for Christians. He says, you think things are bad now? <laughs> wait, just wait. Just wait. In this verse, we see the words, listen, falling away. In the Greek, these words mean to stumble, cause to sin, to give offense. In other words, to put in a trap or snare. 
Jesus is warning his disciples of the spiritual trap that was before them. This is what a good counselor does, what he cautions those he loves, right? He says, hey, look out for this. He wanted his disciples to be prepared for what was about to happen. Oh, my friends, some believe that following Jesus is going to be easy. What has his disciples come? Jesus had already made comments like this. My, my kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Man, that sounds good, doesn't it? to be part of God's kingdom. But listen, we need to remember these disciples were still thinking in an earthly sense. They were thinking Christ was going to set up his kingdom on earth. They were still looking at Jesus as a, as a political savior, as a political messiah. Now he's sitting there saying, listen, y'all are going to fall away. Be, 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 be ready and listen to me because I don't want you to I don't want you to fall away from what I've taught you. I know what's coming. I know what you expect, but I know the reality. Mm. However, when we encounter the hatred of this world, people who think living the Christian life is going to be easy, listen, when they encounter the hatred of this world, they become often shocked and disillusioned. Listen to me. This is what Jesus was warning his disciples about. He did not want them to become shocked or disillusioned to the fact of what was going to happen. Jesus gave counsel to his disciples so they would not be startled and then stumble in their spiritual walk. However, as with Jesus' lessons, these guys didn't listen. You know, Jesus spoke in parables. He spoke oftentimes in a way, and his disciples uh, would just kind of look at him and kind of go, what? What? Well, I don't get it. What we see here is that Christ was telling his disciples what was going to happen, and it just went completely over their heads. In fact, sometimes we see Jesus is bluntly telling his disciples what was going to take place, and they still didn't get it. <coughs> Listen, we see evidence of this because guess what? They didn't take heed to what Jesus just told them. He said, Listen, I don't want you to fall away. And guess what actually happened? They all fell away. That's right. What happened? Upon his arrest, what happened? They fled. During his crucifixion, what is it they hid? After his resurrection, they doubted. And before the coming of the Holy Spirit, they faltered. Only after receiving the Holy Spirit did they act decisively and speak boldly. Listen, there are, there are some that wonder why Jesus warned his disciples when he knew what was going to happen, when he knew they would mess up. Why are you going to warn them if you know they're going to do it anyway? Listen, is God all-knowing? Yes. Is God sovereign? Yes. Listen, he knows the beginning from the very end. However, listen to this. It doesn't take away our responsibility. You are, you are willingly, knowingly falling away. It is your responsibility. And listen to this, without the power of the Holy Spirit, you know what we would do? We would do the same thing. We would be just like these disciples and we would fall away. Because we don't have the power to stay with you. They failed to utilize the resources. So the disciples have been given the resources they needed to stand firm and not stumble. Jesus had given them everything they needed. He had told them everything they were going to need to know and what to do, but yet they still faltered. They failed to utilize the resources, and when the moment of truth came, what they fell under the pressure. He forewarned them to establish their responsibility to God. Not only do we see the council of caution, but we also see the council of hostility. The council of hostility. In verse 2 we read, 
They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kill you will think he is offering service to God. And that day to excommunicate was the worst that could happen to a religious Jew. Not only does a good counsel caution those he loves to listen, but he gives specific counsel. Jesus just didn't give some type of broad counsel, but he was specific in his counsel. He said, this is what's going to happen to you. Jesus told his disciples that they were going to face specific hostility. Christ was specific when he said they will put you out of the synagogues and they will kill you. It was specific. It was definite. Jesus did not counsel in general terms. But he was direct. He was to the point. He said you are going to be excommunicated and you will be killed. Why? To be excommunicated from the synagogue meant that they were cut off from all religious, social, economic aspects of Jewish society. They were looked at as traitors to their people and to their God. However, Jesus told his disciples that excommunication would not be the worst thing that could happen. For some, it would cost them their lives. In fact, they would even be killed in the name of God. Listen, the enemies of God often think they're killing Christians. They think that they're actually performing the work of God. Look at the Apostle Paul. Paul called himself the Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was the ultimate Jew, the ultimate religious person. And what did he do? He was there whenever Stephen was stoned to death. In fact, he held, uh, he held the onlookers closed. He was cheering them on as they stoned God's man to death. Back then, his name was Saul. Back then, his name was Saul. But what do we see? We see that Paul knew both sides of persecution. Whenever he saw the light of Jesus Christ blind him, and whenever he was given new eyes, when the scales came off his eyes, he became, he went from Saul to Paul. He went from a, a killer of Christians to a man that now was a Christian. He went from the persecutor to the persecuted. He went from the hater to the hated. See, Paul understood what it meant to follow Jesus Christ. He knew the hostility. He experienced the hostility that he once demonstrated. So when Christ tells his disciples that they will be kicked out of the synagogue, he was reminding his disciples of his previous comments. He was reminding them. He was constantly putting in their brain, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Do not let this shock you. Hmm. Not only do we see the counsel of caution, the counsel of hostility, but next we see the counsel of purpose. The counsel of purpose. A good counselor will give caution of the traps ahead of you, and he will be specific about the traps ahead of you. But now we see that a good counselor will give you the reason or purpose of the traps ahead of you. What he says in verse 3, we read, And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. Ultimately, the reason why the disciples will be persecuted by their own people is because they do not know God and they refuse to accept the Son of God. Listen, lost people are going to act like lost people. People who are not Christians don't expect them to act like Christians. Don't expect them to see and understand things the way you do because it's not going to happen. In fact, they will hate you. They may not realize it, but they will. Listen. In other words, Jesus was saying there will be people who have religion and not a relationship. These were people who claimed to love and serve God, but they did not know Him intimately. Ultimately, the reason why the disciples will be persecuted by their own people is because they do not know God and they refuse to accept the Son of God. Just think about this for a minute. Just think about it for a minute. Jesus is saying that they were going to be persecuted by what? 
religious people. You're going to be persecuted, and you're going to be persecuted by what? Religious people. Mm. Yeah. The very people you think will be receptive to the gospel will be the ones who hurt you the most. Religious people tend to think that they are good people. However, when confronted with the gospel, they are told that their goodness is worthless. The gospel confronts people what with their own sin. Listen, it's not that they don't understand the gospel, but they choose to be ignorant of the gospel. Amen. It is a willful rejection of truth. They understand it. They just don't want to accept it. Paul writes in Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their own unrighteousness suppress the truth. Mm. This is the reason or purpose of why the disciples will be kicked out of the synagogue and will be kicked. Their persecutors rejected God the Father and they rejected God the Son. Hmm. Not only do we see the counsel of caution, the counsel of hostility, and the counsel of purpose, but next we see the counsel of trust. The counsel of trust. A good counselor will give caution about the traps ahead of you. He will be specific about the traps ahead of you. He, he will even tell you why the traps are there. But now we see that the good counselor wants, to, wants you to trust him. In other words, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, how to handle it, what to do. I'm laying all the resources out in front of you. Listen now, what I want you to do is just trust what I'm telling you. Trust. In verse 4, Jesus said, But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. And our text, notice the word but. Notice the word but. It is a transition word, which means there is a change of pace to this seemingly depressing counseling session. Honestly, so far it sounds pretty depressing, doesn't it? But actually, Jesus is meaning to be encouraged. He was encouraging his disciples. It wasn't supposed to be depressing. He said, I'm saying to you all of these things, and what I want you to simply do is trust me. Yes, you're going to be persecuted. Yes, you're going to get kicked out of the city. Oh, yes, some of you may be killed, but listen, trust me. Trust me. Listen. To say that God is sovereign is to say that He knows the beginning from the end. He is telling His disciples to trust what? In His sovereignty. Trust in His sovereignty. The reason He knows is because He ordained it. And listen, either the, the biggest the biggest doctrine within the scripture that people have a hard time accepting is the sovereignty of Almighty God. The reason God, uh, the reason and He knows what is going to happen in your life, in my life, and everyone around the world, and He knows the beginning to the end is because He has ordained it. He's ordained it. It's part of His plan. God just doesn't make it up as He goes. It's part of His plan. Listen. The reason He knows is because He's ordained it. Jesus said this, when their hour comes. How do we know He's sovereign? Look at what He said. Notice the words. Words are important. When not maybe, not if, but when the hour comes. Jesus knew the day, the hour, the very minute of their persecution. Wow. See, the word hour is commonly used within the Gospel of John to refer to the impending death of Christ. Jesus would say things like this, My hour has not yet come. 
Jesus knew the time, the hour, the minute of his own death on the cross. He knew the hour, the very minute of his very resurrection out of the tomb. He knew the hour, the very minute, the very, the very second that he would ascend into heaven. Why? Because it was ordained before the foundations of the earth. Listen. He knew the time of his own suffering was coming clear, coming close. While Christ walked on this earth with his disciples, he suffered the blunt of persecution. Listen to this. How often do we read in the Gospels where the disciples were persecuted with Christ? We don't. It was Christ who took the blunt of the persecution. Everybody said, if we, can, if, we can, if we can take out the head, we can get rid of the rest. So Jesus took the blunt of the persecution for his disciples. However, he knew that after his death and resurrection, that the tables would turn and his disciples would feel the force of the opposition. In verse 5, we see a confronting, comforting message, excuse me. We see a comforting message that says that you may remember. You may remember. Listen, he was not going to let them forget. He wasn't going to let them forget. He was not going to let them forget that he is sovereign ruler of all. Amen. Everything that has occurred, I have planned. Amen. Which means that I have a plan for you. Hmm. These trials and tribulations would be used to strengthen their faith. He knew that persecution, listen, what do we learn more? We learn more through trials and tribulations. We learn more from the persecution than we do on the mountaintop being celebrations. The celebration's great, man. We have fun and we need to rejoice in those. But listen to me, where do we learn? We learn in the valleys of life. That's where God grows us and that's where He teaches us. And what he's telling his disciples is, guess what? You're going to learn and grow in the persecution that you will face. My friends, keep trusting in the counsel of the sovereign God. What can we learn from this? What can we take home from this? This is it. Listen, we, we, we as believers, we as rekindled church need to put our trust. We need to remember the counsel of a sovereign God. Listen, through the Scriptures, He has cautioned us of the traps that lay ahead. He has told us the hostilities of these traps. He has told us the purpose and the reason of these traps. Listen, are you going through trials and tribulations of life? If you're not, I promise you, you're fixing to. Are you, are you facing some type of tribulation? Maybe you're facing some persecution of your faith. Listen, if we are going to be a witness in a hated world, then we must trust in the counsel and sovereignty of a holy God. I had a friend of mine tell me one time, God doesn't waste pain. God doesn't waste pain. Not only do we see the counsel to the witness, but next we see the challenge of the witness. Because of Christ. Is such a wonderful counselor. He challenges those who follow him. A good counselor does what? He challenges you. He challenges you. As human beings, if we are not challenged, then we will never grow physically or spiritually. If a person desires to have muscles but never works out in the gym, guess what's going to happen? Have this. <laughs> If I, want to, if I want to be healthy and I want my I want my body to be healthy, but yet, man, I'm constantly going to Wendy's. Is that gonna help? No. No. If a person never picks up the word of God and applies it to their life, they will never grow closer to the Lord. 
Listen to me. If a person desires to be intimate and know God, to truly know Him and, and have a relationship with Him, but they never pick up the Scriptures, then listen to me. You'll never grow. And you'll never know Him. You'll remain an infant spiritually. Hmm. This is why Christ will challenge you. Christ allows challenges in your life to help you grow. We see the challenge of selfishness in our text. In verses 5 and 6 we read, But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me where are you going, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. These men have lived with Jesus for how long? For three years, but yet they were spiritual infants. Man, they had walked with Jesus. They had walked beside Jesus. They ate with Jesus, slept with Jesus. Man, they did everything Jesus did. They were there with him. They were right beside him, but yet they were spiritual infants. Man, they walked right beside God. But they were still babies, spiritually. Hmm. Now this goes to prove going to church doesn't make you spiritually mature. Amen. It just goes to show that you can do all the religious things you want. And guess what? It still won't grow you spiritually. The only way you can grow spiritually is by diving into the Word of God and learning the Scriptures and having someone help you teach you how to study the Scriptures. Wow. These men had lived with Jesus for three years. Yeah, they were still spiritual infants. The fact that they failed to ask Jesus, listen, look what they failed to ask him. This ought to show you how self-consumed they are. They said that they failed to ask Jesus, where are you going? This shows us their very need for spiritual growth. For spiritual growth. It is true that Peter once asked Jesus, he said, he said, Lord, where are you going? But he wasn't looking at it through a spiritual lens. He was looking at it through a physical lens, just like a little child would ask, Daddy, where are you going? He wasn't looking at it through a spiritual lens. He was looking at it through 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 a, a, a selfish lens. Lord, I can't believe you're going to leave me alone. I can't believe you're just going to leave me. You, we've been so dependent on you. You said you were going to be part of your kingdom and now you're going to leave. We'll go back to what we said before. They listened to what Jesus taught. But what they heard in their ears hadn't made it to their heart. Hmm. They failed to ask, where are you going? None of the disciples had asked Christ this question with spiritual perception. Jesus had already told them that he was going to die and come back to life, but they were still clueless. If they had understood these things, they would have desired to comfort the Lord. If they had truly understood what Christ was going to do, that he was going to the cross to carry the weight of the world's sin. They would have had the attitude of comfort. They would have been empathetic. But they weren't. They were very selfish human beings. They were concerned with their own well-being and not Christ's well-being. Wow. If they had understood these things, they would have desired to comfort them. However, we see that their hearts were full of sorrow. Instead, instead of looking at the cross and understanding that Christ was going to the cross to pay the penalty of their sins, instead of that, if they had understood that, they would have rejoiced. They would have gone and said, Lord, Lord, we know what you're about to do. We understand that this is a hard task that you are doing. It's unthinkable. But Lord, we're so glad you're going to do this for us. That's not what they said. Instead, we see, instead of rejoicing, their hearts were full of sorrow. They were full of sorrow because they were self-consumed. 
They were self-consumed. We see the contrast between the selfishness of, uh, selflessness of Christ and the selfishness of the disciples. Christ should have been the main focus and it, 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 it should have been in their hearts to comfort Christ. They were not concerned what this moment for Christ was about, but only what it meant for them instead. Wow. They should have been excited about the fact that Jesus is going to the Father, but instead they were self-consumed. And listen, how often in life do we get so self-consumed in our own life that our eyes get off the cross? We get so self-consumed in our own little American world, own little American lifestyle, own little American comfort, that we tend to be selfish instead of looking at our hearts. Not only do we see the challenge of selfishness, but we see the, the challenge of submission. This is the only way a selfish heart can be transformed is through the power of what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings submission to the believer. It allows us to submit to the Lord. In verse 7 we read, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Wow, wow, that's cool. Jesus was saying, I know that you're a bunch of selfish human beings. I know that you're a bunch of selfish men. And the only way you can submit is that the helper comes. Listen, I have to leave. And it's to your advantage that I leave. Because if I stick by you, you're never going to grow. If I stick by you physically, you're never going to grow. So I'm going to do something better. It's to your advantage. Because this is what's going to happen. Is that it's going to be better than me just being beside you. I'm going to be in you. Amen. It's going to be better than me just walking beside you. I'm sending the help. Sending the comfort. I'm sending my power. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead is going to live in you. Amen. Mm. Why? He says it's to your advantage that I go away. Jesus' purpose for, uh, for coming to the world was what? To die. His purpose was to die. He came not to be ministered to, but to minister and give his life as a ransom for many. If Christ had not died on the cross and rose again, then the helper would not have come. In John MacArthur's commentary of John, he states two reasons why the Holy Spirit did not come until after Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension. First, the Spirit's ministry is to reveal the person and works of Christ. In other words, guess what? And only until Christ's work was completely done. It was, the job's whole, it was the job of the Holy Spirit to reveal through spiritual eyes everything that was for her. Hmm. Listen. Second, the Father gave the Spirit to the church to vindicate His Son's faithfulness in completing the work of salvation, his death and resurrection. Listen, the Holy Spirit turned these men from wimps to witnesses. He took these men to a bunch of people who, who were kind of clueless to people who now understood. And the only way that could have happened is through the power of the Holy Spirit bringing upon their heart submission to God's Word. My friends, as we walk with the Lord, we will face challenges. So often we face life's problems with a me-centered point of view. Listen, if we are not careful, we will make following Jesus all about me and not about Him. We will make it about our loss, not about the cross. As believers, life is not about us anymore. Following Jesus ain't about you. By Him. This is why believers were told to pick up their cross daily, deny themselves, and follow Him. The Lord knew 
that we could not do this in our own power. We could not submit in our own power. We could not follow him in our own power. And this is why he sent the helper. He sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us what? He teaches us. He teaches me today to submit. To submit. Hmm. In other words, he tells me to die to myself. This is the only way we can be a witness to the hated world. The only way we can be a light in the darkness. To be a witness in the hated world, we must first heed the counsel to the witness. Second, we must accept the challenge to the witness. Now third, we must understand the channel to the witness. The channel to the witness. It's a good counselor who will give good advice and bestows wisdom to others. He will also challenge people to grow and mature, but a good counselor will also tell you how things work. He just doesn't leave you blind. A good counselor shows you how things work. And our text says that the Holy Spirit is the channel in which God uses in our lives to accomplish His work. In verses 8 and 9 we read, And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me. We need to remember that the Holy Spirit does not just minister to believers, but also to an unbelieving world. Hmm. See, the word convict is a terminology equated with a judicial system. However, the ancient Greek translation has a broader meaning than just a judicial system. It means to expose, to refute, and to convince. This, my friends, is the work of the Holy Spirit in the world and in the individual hearts. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convince, to convict of the truth. No one can be a saved apart from the Spirit's convicting uh, and regenerating work. Jesus has already said to his disciples, no one can come to me unless the Father has sent, or whoever has sent me draws them. What does it mean to be drawn by the power of the Holy Spirit? It means to be convicted of sin. In other words, it needs to be convinced of my situation. It needs to be convinced of what I am. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to penetrate hearts steeped in sin, overcome sinners' resistance to the gospel, and bring them to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in the Spirit's mission to present the truth about Jesus Christ what to the world. Those who reject the truth will be found guilty and judged by the Son and the Father. To the sole issue that determines people's eternal destiny is how they react to the Spirit's convicting ministry concerning their own sin and provision of forgiveness by grace through Jesus Christ. See, the channel of the Holy Spirit's convicting power works through the proclamation of the Scriptures. How does God convict the world of sin? Huh. It is by the foolishness of preaching that men are saved. <laughs> Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by what? The Word of God. Someone had to present the Gospel to you. If you were saved this morning, guess what? Someone had to present the Gospel to you. And God used us feeble, faltered men and women to share the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And it convicted your heart. Amen. Wow. Maybe someone gave you a Bible and you began to read it. Listen, God sent someone in your life to give you a Bible. God used feeble men and women. He used flawed human beings to share the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that not amazing? It's amazing. But it is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's simply our job as believers to give a message. That's all we're required to do. Now that we've examined the channel of conviction, let's examine the channel of righteousness. In verse 10 we read, Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Listen, the Holy Spirit brings the conviction of sin. 
And God uses human hands as instruments to go and, and share the gospel to a lost world. He uses us to share the message, but He does the work of convicting. He convicts them of sin. But listen, He convicts them of what? Their own unrighteousness. The opposite of righteousness is unrighteousness. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, the Holy Spirit brings the conviction of sin, and He reveals our own unrighteousness. Because Christ went to the cross, was resurrected, and ascended into heaven, He proved that He was and is the righteous Son of God. He proved that He was right and we're wrong. Amen. Mm. As sinners, we can, we can and never will be righteous. This is why we're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I talked about this last night to a bunch of kids. And I had one little kid ask me, well, I thought this just blessed my heart. And I asked him, what do you think righteousness means? Hands flew up everywhere. And it's fun to hear what, Christ, what, 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 what kids say. But I'm going to tell you, can I be real with you? None of them were wrong. They had a better idea about it than we do. And I went to one kid and I asked him, I said, what does it mean that Christ is righteous? I don't know, maybe he might have been eight, seven. He looked at me, well, if he's right, then we must be wrong. Hmm. No, that's right. He has to listen to me. Because we're wrong, what does God do with the power of the Holy Spirit? He puts on us the breastplate of righteousness. What does that tell us? It means He covers our entire being, the center of our being with His righteousness. What does a breastplate cover? It covers the center of who you are. It covers your heart. It guards your heart. Oh, my friends, that's what the righteousness of Jesus Christ does because our wickedness is so, so horrible. We are totally depraved before God. It is a horrible condition, but God takes this depraved, rotten heart and He clothes me with His righteousness. He takes what's so wrong with me. And He puts His righteousness on. Oh, is that not good Oh, that's so good news. It's His righteousness, not, not my right. Oh, as sinners, we can never be righteous. This is why He clothed us in His righteousness. See, the moment we are saved, guess what happens? The moment we are saved, we are clothed with His righteousness. Amen. Guess what God sees in us? He doesn't see what we were. He sees who we are in Christ. He sees His Son. He doesn't see us. Hmm. Listen, when we have been given the righteousness of God so we can tell others how to receive His righteousness. We have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ so we can tell other people how to go out and how to have that same thing. Wow. We're part of it. God uses the Holy Spirit to go out and tell people of their sin. He uses the Holy Spirit to convict of sin. He goes to, 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 to convict people of their own unrighteousness so that we see His righteousness. And guess who He uses to do that? He uses me and He uses you to go out and share that kind of news. Again, it blows my mind. Now that we've examined the channel of conviction and righteousness, let us now examine the channel of judgment. In verse 11, we read this, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Hmm. See, the Holy Spirit not only convicts of our sin and reveals to us our unrighteousness, but He also reveals judgment. He reveals judgment. The judgment of Satan himself means that there will be a final reckoning between God and Satan. Listen, the Holy Spirit warns the world of this coming judgment. Normally, conviction is followed by what? Judgment. 
When you stand before a judge, you are convicted. You're shown what's wrong with you. And at the end of that, what happens? Boom! You're sent off to jail. Listen, the judges of this world are flawed. That's right. And they get it wrong. In fact, honestly, the way I see it now, I think they get it wrong more than they get it right. But we have a supreme judge, a godly judge, a righteous judge that always gets it right. Amen. He always gets it right. He never falls. And the Holy Spirit warns the world of this coming judgment. Wow, when the Holy Spirit works, there is an in-between step. The revelation of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which can satisfy the judgment for the convicting power of sin. And guess what? Sin, God convicts us. But I'm so glad there's an in-between step here. He convicts us. He shows us his judge. He shows us what's going to happen. And what's cool is a great thing called salvation. And he sits there and says, this is, what, this is what you are. This is what you deserve. But I can forgive you. I can cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. I can throw it down to the depths of the bottom of the sea and I will remember it no more. Great little song I heard the other day about Gordon Moat. And it's called for, uh, forgive and forget. And that's what Christ does. He forgives us and he forgets. He's the only one that can truly do that. Wow. Forgive and forget. Oh, what a privilege it is for the believer to share this with the lost world. For those who are saved and no longer have to fear his judgment. Amen. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, of unrighteousness, and he, he, he reveals His judgment. Listen, it's not our job to save anyone. <laughs> it's just our job to tell. I'm going to tell you, to tell people about the judgment of sin does not sound very cool. In fact, it's what we hear very weak in gospel presentations is that there is a judgment for sin. There is a judgment. We don't do it out of arrogance. We don't do it out of out of uh, just trying to scare someone into heaven. We do it out of love, out of love for people, out of love for them. We tell them of God's judgment. It's a privilege for us to do that because guess what? We've been saved from God's judgment and we can tell other people how they can be saved. However, Christ has given us the privilege of sharing this great good news. When we can, we can tell them about God's judgment, we can tell this world how they can be saved from an eternity in hell. And that's, that's amazing to me. Listen, so to be an effective witness for Christ, we need to recognize that many people will not like our message and therefore they may not like us. If we are faithful, we may suffer persecution even to death. Even given the that unpleasant prospect, what should motivate us to bear witness? The Lord's glory. What should motivate us to bear witness in such a hostile world? It's simple. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about God and his glory. Listen, he is now risen from the dead at the right hand of the Father, returning soon to judge the world in his, in, in, with his righteousness. He has entrusted us the message of salvation through the cross. We can't compromise the message by hiding the reality of judgment if people do not repent. Amen. Don't be self-righteous, but do tell the truth about God's coming judgment. Hmm. Our task to a witness in the power of the Holy Spirit to a hostile world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. It's just our job to tell people. Not our job to not our job to do the work. We just simply 
tell people. God convicts the world. He convicts the hostile world in which we live. I don't know about you, but that takes a lot of pressure off. But guess what? There's some people in your life, I promise you, that do not want to hear the gospel. You'll have people in your life who they might even hate you for it, but listen to me, you keep pressing forward with the truth of who God is. You just tell them, and you let God do the work. Amen. You let God do the work. And always remember this. Remember that our counselor that we have and that we love, the one who saved us, our wonderful counselor, he is sovereign over all. And whenever we go out and we share the gospel with people to a lost and hostile world, he already knows who's going to accept it. And he already knows who will reject it. We just leave it in his sovereign hand. We just leave it with him. Let's go to the Lord for prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, thank you for letting us be here in the house of the Lord. Lord, uh, be with us as we go out to be witnesses in this hostile world. And Lord, we love you. In your precious name we pray. Amen.